Um, a lot of time we did talk about the binary outcomes, right? So the question 23, 24, and 25 are due today. Uh, and uh, I still might have my office hours at the 3 p.m. in case you, you still have a question, right? Please feel free to go uh, on Zoom and ask me about it. All right, so other than that, I would like to move on to the next topic with you today. So let me share with you the slide in the PowerPoint a little bit. Okay, so remember the other day we talked about SBC, right? That's an overview. And overall, Overly, in uh, there are four main activities in SPC. The first activity is capability analysis, right? Uh, capability analysis is for us to judge to what extent we stay true to the design specification. We learn about the CP, CPU, CPL, uh, CPK, right? Uh, and we we learn a whole host of probabilities uh, in different contexts, right? So those are for capability analysis. What is the uh, extent to which we stay with uh, the design specification, right? Or the capability of conforming to the design spe specification. So that's the first activity. Uh, we learned through all, many uh, things right, uh, for that, right? Uh, and today we're gonna move on to the next step, conformance analysis. So in conformance analysis, we can uh, monitor our process in real time, uh, collect data, and look for uh, special variation or a sudden will cause variation, right? And if there is a special variation, we're gonna invest, investigate for the causes of that special variation, right? So that's authority right here. And then uh, move on, we move on to try to eliminate the special cause in the future. Right, or we try to make the process more robust. So what we see right here is a loop, never ending loop. In each round, we have four activities, uh, analysis for the capability, and then conformance analysis, and then uh, we, we look for the causes, right? And then we try to avoid the causes in the future. So every time we make our process more robust, we do this every day, every week, every, every month, every year, right? Then it, it never ends and uh, every time we make it better, better and better. So over time, our process should be a very good one, right? So th that's the idea behind SPC. Uh, uh, and again, we already talked about capability analysis and today we need to go to conformance analysis. So let me show you where you can find that in the PowerPoint. So conformance analysis is uh, uh, right here, right? We use control charts to monitor the process. And by looking at the control charts, we're gonna find out that there is a special variation, right? So we're gonna learn how to read if there is a special variation in the chart. Uh, and technically we need to draw the chart first, right? So uh, I would like to point you, you here to these slides. Um, I, I will make it on the notes for you. Uh, this is uh, the equations to draw the chart. Right. Uh, there are four charts that we learned the X bar chart, the R chart, the P chart, and the C chart that we learned in our class. In the textbook, I think that they only have the, the X bar chart and the P chart and a little bit of the C chart. But here to be complete, we're going to talk about all four charts. Okay. Um, and uh, how to draw the chart? I wish I had time to show you the detailed step in class, but we do not have that time. So I make some YouTube videos to uh, show you how to draw the chart step by step. Uh, so let me go uh, to the whiteboard and uh, organize our um, notes. So we are doing uh, module five, right? About quality management. So the topic that we talk about now is 
conformance analysis. So remember, this is a second main activity. of SBC. So in this case, right, we monitor our process. With or through the through the control chart. Right. So we use the control charts to monitor our process. Possibility number one, if we see only natural or common cause variation, then we say that the process is in control. So in this case, we look at the statistics. That's why they say it in a complete sentence. Then we say that the process is in statistical control. But then a lot of the time we just say that the process is in control for short, sure, right? Everybody knows that we look at the st statistic to say it is in control or not, right? So, uh, so we just say that the process is in control. So in control doesn't mean that we, we control everything. We 100% control all of the input variable or the environmental variable. We, we cannot do that, right? So in control here just means that we only see the common cause variation. Normally, they are small variation. They do not impact our quality, uh, quality of the products that much. And one more important thing, if it is a common cause variation, there are so many things, there are so many factors uh, that kind of intermingle and, and cause the variation, right? There's no way for us to single it out or to separate one cause to deal with it. So we have to, take that as is. So in this case, we say that the process is in control, even if we do not want to percent control the process, okay? So that's the first thing. Uh, but in the second possibility, if we see both um, natural and, and special variation, natural variation, And, uh, and special variation. Then we say that the process is out of control. All right, so that's a concept. We, we use a control chart to monitor our process to see if the process is in control or out of control. So if it is out of control or the second possibility here, then uh, we would do the following. We would investigate for the cause behind the special variation, right? Uh, or sometimes we have multiple causes. And then um, if we already know the cause of the causes, then uh, we can fix it today. Fix it now. And we can avoid it in the future altogether, right? Um, how to do that? We're gonna 
try to make the process more robust so that we do not have to face with the problem again and again. All right, so that's, that's the main idea of these uh, using the control charts to monitor and then and take uh, decisions if necessary. Right. Okay, so that's the, the overview of co uh, conformance analysis. Now the question is, what control charts do we use? To monitor our process, right? So there are two uh, types of control charts. So, uh, but in total, we have four control charts. These are the most popular control charts. Uh, we divide these four control charts into two groups. The first group is for uh, continuous metrics. What does that mean, continuous metrics? For example, if we measure the length, the um, temperature, the sugar content, right? Something like that. One more. Then all of these are measured on a continuum, right? So we call it as a continuous metric. Uh, so if we look at the line, the temperature, the content of the, the product, then we would use uh, these two charts. The first one here is called the R chart. The other is called the X bar chart. All right. Why do we call it as an R chart? Because we we look at the range of variation. We want to have a small range of variation because with that we we can more easily control the process, right? But in this case, uh, so so that's why we call it as a the R chart because we look at the range. And the X bar chart is for us to look at the average. Right, the average of the, of the process, the average of the products, or the output. So that's a continuous metrics. And in the second group, we talk about the discrete metrics. What are the discrete metrics? In our class, we're gonna focus on the number of errors. For the number of defects, right? So these number of errors can either be zero error, one error, two errors, three errors, things like that, right? So that's why it is discrete. The the value itself, right, is it, just limited to some uh, discrete values. So uh, discrete metrics, and for that we're gonna use about the we we'll learn about the uh, P chart. And the other is a C chart. Okay, so the P chart is for the percentage. So we talk about the percentage, or the, sorry, the proportion or percentage, right? Proportion or percentage of errors or defects. Uh, and that's why we call it the P chart. And the C chart is the number of defects itself. Right? So the count of the number of errors, the count of the defects themselves. Right? So we call it the C chart. Um, I would like to refer you to the slides so that uh, you're gonna see the equation behind these uh, charts. So the R chart is look at module five, July 55 and 56. The X bar chart is also module five, July 54. The P chart is 
module five and slide 37. The C chart is module five and slide 58. All right, so we uh, we have all of the equations over there. It is technical, but it's not that hard. You would learn how to draw all these four charts in Excel, all right? Uh, that's a good skill uh, right there to learn. Uh, to help you, you know what? I, I, I wish I had time uh, to go through the step with you in, in the class context like this so that we can have the interaction, right? But because we are short on time, so I would like to refer you to the YouTube videos that I, uh, that I posted. So please check out the uh, Excel and also the YouTube videos. that you can find in module five. Right. The videos are on YouTube. So in module five, you can see the link uh, that direct you to uh, YouTube. Right. So again, we learned about four uh, control charts in our class, the R chart, the X bar chart, the P chart, and the C chart. Right. Depending on our need, we're gonna, we're gonna use one or two. Okay, how about the C chart? Why do we have to count the number of, of errors? For example, in a car factory, right? After they paint the car, then uh, they need to visually check around the car for blemishes. Right? If it's a thick, uh, thick chunk of a paint, something like that, that will uh, not make it look good, right? So they have to walk around the car and, and check if there is a, a defect. If there's a defect, they will uh, use some kind of chalk, white chalk, and some some chalk, color chalk, right, to to mark the spot. And then they uh, the, they send the car back to the shop so that they can uh, rework on the paint of the car. If you know about Rolls Royce or many uh, luxury car brand, they have to they walk around especially very uh, experienced in, in the, the checking, right? They walk around the car, they look at all of the reflection on the paint job and find out if there's a problem with the paint job. Sometimes machine doesn't uh, do that perfectly, right? So they, they have to do it the specialty. They check and then uh, they send the car back to the shop, okay? So in that case, you have to use a C chart because we, we count the number of blemishes on the paint job or the number of defects, right, on the paint. Uh, um, the P chart is different from the C chart because we, uh, a little bit, because we look at the percentage, right? Uh, for example, out of 100 cars, how many cars uh, are with the paint defects? Things like that. Okay, so those are the four control charts for us to lo look at different uh, dimensions or. Uh, different statistics of the products, right? All right, so that's the the overview. And now uh, the question is, how a chart would look like, right? Because I don't have time to show you the, the step through. So it's better that I will take you, uh, take a, an example to show you how a chart would look like. Uh, and then at, the, at home, you can try that in Excel. Uh, by the way, let me go back to this. These two charts right here, R chart and X bar chart, will show up as question 22 in, in homework three, right? And the P and the C chart will show up uh, as question 23 in the homework three. So the bottom line is this chart right here will be in the part three, part two of the homework three. Right? All right, so uh, let's continue with um, the example of a chart. So example of a control chart. Let's take the X bar chart as our example. We call that as the X bar chart because we're looking at the averages of the product, right? Um, but remember any chart is a visual or the visualization of the data, right? So before we can draw any chart, we have to have the data. 
Let me show you how the data of this chart look like. So we have a Y table like this. It is a Y table because we have many samples in it. Okay, so we have uh, uh, the sample laid out horizontally. So let me write here, these are for the samples. All right, so we have sample one, sample two, sample three, all the way to sample K. All right, so this sample one is right here, sample two, sample three, on and on, all the way to sample K. So K here can be 30, can be 50, right, depending on your choice. If you want to see more benchmark, more details, you want to do more K, right? Otherwise, K of, of 30 is, is a power of choice for the uh, number of samples. And in each sample, we're going to randomly select some item. I mean, for each sample, right? We take one unit here, take one unit there, and put it in the sample. So we have item number one, item number two all the way to item N. All right, so these are the number of items in one sample. And actually it is your decision. You want to do 10 per sample or 15 or even 20 per sample. Uh, and that is your decision. You can be anywhere in between, right? Uh, 11, 13 uh, items in one sample, uh, that's fine. As long as you think that it is helpful for you to monitor your process. Um, so at the end of the day, we have all of the data here, right? These are the measurements for unit one, two, three, all the way to the last uh, unit in the sample. And then, uh, and you know what? The sample here sometimes are just simply the, the dates, right? Day one, day two, day three, on and on, all the way to the, the day K. And, can, uh, and then for sample three, we have that number, we have this number, we have that number too. Right. Okay, we also have that number, number, number. So these are the data that we need to use uh, to draw, draw the chart, right? Um, how do we have these data in real life? Then you might need to monitor a process, either you or uh, you ask some associate, right? Randomly pick some items and then measure them up and then put all, all of the measurement inside the table right here. Another day goes by, we delete the column number one. We add a, another column at the uh, end of the table, right? So actually this is a moving uh, a moving window of data. So earlier, right, I already talked about uh, we can manually measure things up and then put it in the table. But you know what, today we have many modern uh, processes where they, they uh, automatically record the, the variables, right? Record the, uh, the, the measurements of the units and then relay the information directly onto a server or to your computer, right? Uh, especially, especially today we have the IoT. IoT stand for Internet of Things. They are the sensors, the probes, all of the automatic measurement equipment. They measure, they collect the data and relay the data uh, right to our computer. Right, so the data can be manually collected or it can be automatically collected, like what I just said. Okay, so, so now that we have the data, right? Then how does a chart look like? So remember the the samples here normally uh, is uh, collected over time in the chronological order, so we can lay them out on the the timeline. We have uh, sample one, sample two, sample three, all the way to sample K, right? And then for each of the sample, we would calculate the average. This is one sample, we calculate the average. Another sample, we calculate another average, 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 right? And then we chart it up in the chart right here. So it might look like the following.
right? So these are the, uh, the fluctuation of the process or the variation of the process. And then we draw a line through, uh, by the way, this, this red part right here is called the run chart. Let me make a note, I forgot. All right, the red variation right here is called the run chart. Because it tells us how the process is doing, right? Oops, sorry. Run chart. Okay, uh, but if we only have the one chart, then there's no visual cue for us to say that the process is in control or out of control. So that's why now we have to start putting in the benchmark. The first benchmark is a center line, right? So that's a center line. In this particular case, the center line is the average of the averages. So that's why it is a two, X2 bar, right? Each value that we see here in the red line uh, is uh, an average. So if we do the center line through, it is an average of all of the averages. Uh, so that's why we, we do the average twice and we call that as an X bar. Uh, together with the center line, we also have a line at the top called the upper control limit, right? And another line at the bottom called the lower control limit. So uh, the center line, the upper control limit, and the lower control limit will, will help us to more easily identify if a process is in control or out of control. Right? Remember, the goal of using the control chart is if, to find out if there is any special variation. If there is no special variation, we say that the process is in control. Right? But if there, there is special variation that we say that the process is out of control. So that's the meaning behind what we do here. Right? We uh, collect the data, draw the chart, look at the chart and find out if there is a special variation. And if uh, there is a special variation, then we have to think about what to do with it. Right? So I would like to um, talk next about how to identify a process is in control or uh, out of control. All right, so a process is in control By the way, uh, the reference here is module five, slide 50. Okay, so a process is in control if all of the following happen. happen. Uh, okay, so the first one is, the first clue is the points have to be inside, to be between the uh, upper control limit and the lower control limit. Right? The, all the points have to be inside. And uh, there is no sudden jump outside of the limits. Uh, the upper and the lower limit, the, all the points have to be inside and there's no, no sudden jump outside. The top clue to for us to say that the process is in control if, um, I mean, another feature of a process is in control is we have the random points above and below the center line. Right, so the points have to be randomly distributed above and below the center line. So if the process is totally random, then roughly speaking, we're gonna have 50% of the points below and 50% of, of the points above the center line. So that's another clue. The next clue to say that, I mean, all of these have to happen, but the next requirement is, uh, there must be no pattern.
right? The patterns here can either be like the twins or the cycles or other types of, of pattern, right? Sometimes it's not that easy. And then only a twin person can see that it is a pattern. The fifth requirement for a process to be in control is there must be no drift uh, or shift. in the average value, right? Okay, so in this case, right, uh, because uh, what what is a drift and shift? For example, when uh, we buy a new car, the car can go straight by itself, right? But if we, uh, uh, but over time, something might get loosened inside the car and the car either veer to the left by itself, it will veer to the right by itself, right? So that's a shift in the average value weather. But, so that's the requirements for a process to be in control. A process out of control means what? Uh, a process is out of control if we have one of the opposites of the other, right? If we violate one requirement in uh, in the top part of the note we here, then we say that the process is out of uh, out of control. Right? To to be in control, we have to meet all of the requirements. And if we violate one, then the process is out of control. Okay. So uh, at this point, I think that is a good time for me to show you some conceptual example. And we will learn uh, the concept of how the the process looks like, how to read out if there's a special variation, and then what to do with it. Right. So let me give you uh, some example. Example number one. So we have a process like this. Let's draw it and then I'll ask the whole class, what do you think about it? Right, we have the timeline right here because um, the samples are collected over time. Right? And then we have uh, the measurement here. And then uh, we have the two bands, one top, one down. And then in the middle, we have the center line. And when we draw the run chart, this is gonna look like the following. I would like to ask the whole class, is the process in control or out of control? What do you think about this chart? Okay, I see a lot, a lot of uh, responses already. All of you say it is in control. Uh, that is correct. Because in this case, right, we do not see any pattern. We don't see any drift or shift. We don't see any uh, points outside of the band. Um, and roughly speaking, have the points above, have, have the point below, right? This one right here, let me uh, show you. So that's uh, the requirement to be a process in control. And with that example sketch, right, we do not see anything special. It meets all the requirements of a process in control. So we say that this process is in control. Let me show you another example.
So again, we have the timeline, the measurement on the vertical axis. We have the upper band, upper limit, lower limit, and then the center line in the middle. And we um, and when we draw the, the run chart, it looks like the following. I would like to ask the whole class, is the process in control or out of control? What do you think about this part? Of? Okay, so I see that some of you say that out. Uh, okay. One say in. How about other students? What do you think? Is that in control or out of control? Okay. So I, I see another reinforcement of the in control. Okay, so at least we have two camps here. So do we have that as in control or out of control, right? Then here's the answer. The process is out of control. Is that because it's following like a pattern or a trend? That is correct, Well, That is correct. We violate one of the, oh, it's okay. <laughs> we are learning. I know that this is kind of the first or the second time that we had to deal with this. Might be in the textbook, they don't even show you this kind of example, right? I have to make it up so that we learn the concept here. Um, we we violate the no patterns, right? You see the, the fourth item right here? There must be no pattern for the process to be in control. But in this case, we, we see a pattern here, right? So the process is out of control. And of course, I would like to give you some example about it. Wait, so why do you say that a, a pattern deems a process out of control? Wouldn't a okay. pattern indicate that there could be some sort of variable that's being affected by management or something along those lines? Yeah, you're right. No, you're right. Well, I will give you some more uh, example and then you can see that. But in this case, okay, let me uh, talk about what might happen in real life. For example, you uh, uh, somebody record a song in a video. Uh, in a studio, right? You have a, you reserve a room, you record a song, something like that. Uh, and then in the middle of the recording, somebody nearby mows their lawn, okay? Then at the end, because you do not isolate your rooms uh, very, uh, very uh, well. So all of the cyclical patterns of the machine, right? Will be recorded in the, in the, in the song. So when you listen to the song beside all of the good things of the song, right? You might hear the cyclical pattern for that. So definitely the cyclical, so that's the something that uh, special is, is affecting our process. So we have a special variation, right? Because of that, right? Uh, if you think about that in real life, we, we might see here or there. Well, if you, um, some of the videos that, that you listen to, you might see the, the lawn mower, okay? Uh, so, so that's out of control, right? Because we cannot control that specific cause of variation. Uh, so it is out of control. So in that case, right, we, uh, as a manager, we have to kind of isolate our rooms better, uh, our studios better, so that we do not take in all the unwanted noises from the environment. Okay, so uh, we have out of control here. In the first picture, we are in control because the process is totally random. It is called natural variation or the common cause variation. There's no way for us to single out a cause so that we can deal with it. But in the second example, it is out of control because at the end, we're gonna find a 
because we see that special variation and then we can find a special cause behind it, right? And then we try to eliminate the cause. Okay, so that's the idea of being control and not control. Let me show you another example. I know it is early on, right? We are all on something new here. So uh, <clears throat> sometimes we might get confused. All right, uh, another example for you. Assume that we have a manufacturing uh, facility near the LA airport. You know that in the El Segundo area, there are some high tech firms. They even produce parts for NASA to put in the space shuttle or uh, other equipment, right? Uh, space equipment. So um, they have a very high performance uh, processes over there. Okay. So assume that we have a, a manufacturing uh, facility near the LAX airport, and then we measure up our unit. And we see the following. So that's the measurement, that's the timeline. Uh, we have the band, band here, uh, the standard line in the middle. Okay, and here is, here is how it looked like. So uh, it looks like the following. And we see this jump every 45 seconds. Every 45 seconds. Well, I want to make it clear. Okay. Every 40, 45 seconds. Is the process in or out of control? What do you think? All right, bottom out, arena out. Now go outside. The leader in. Yeah, everybody, please uh, think about it and uh, and then share what you think about this, uh, what you see in this process. So at least we have two camps over here, right? Uh, Christopher, oh, out of control seems uh, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> Christopher, you, you are very good. You uh, will be a good manager uh, in, in a facility nearby the LAX airport. You have to be very conscious about the impact from the airport. And that's the point of this example. All right, so in this case, we have a, a process out of control. Uh, again, we are still learning a new concept here. Sometimes it's, it's confusing, okay? In this particular case, okay, uh, we are near the LAX airport and during the regular times, not the pandemic time, okay? Every 45 seconds, we might have an airplane taking off. The, the engine setting at that time is nearly the maximum, okay? And the rumbling or the roaring of the engines will cause a lot of vibration in the air. That vibration will be transferred to our facility the whole building with the foundation might be shaking and the machine themselves will be shaking, right? Then the cut, the manufacturing part might have a, a bleep like this every 45 seconds. So as a manager, right, we look at this, now we realize that something special going on. Uh, definitely there's a special variation uh, in our process right now. So we say that the process is out of control. So in this case, it is out of control because we see a pattern here. 
This pattern is not cyclical, right? But it is regular. The bleep happens every 45 seconds. So <clears throat> definitely that's, that's a pattern right there. Um, and now we, we know that because we're near the LAX airport and, and that might be the cause. So as a manager, we, it means that we have to think about how to insulate ourselves isolate ourselves from the vibration in the air, put more buffer under the machine, right? So that the machine is stable all the time and will produce the units with only the natural variation rather than the special variation that we see now, right? So to that the point of, of using the control chart, we monitor our process and find out if there's a special variation, then investigate for the cause, and then make our decision accordingly. All right, so that's example number three. Let me give you another example where we can talk about the, the service in industry, right? The control charts are not just for the manufacturing uh, processes. It can also be used in, in services processes. So let's uh, assume that we have a restaurant or you are the manager of the restaurant, right? Um, in the service industry, we care about the number of defects or the number of errors. Yeah, defects sounds a little bit more manufacturing. So in this case, let's, let's talk about this as the number of errors. So we talk about the C chart, right? The C chart is where we show the number of errors. All right, we have the timeline, we have the errors, uh, we draw the bands by that, the center line by that. And now we draw the chart and we see the following. We have errors every day, but every Wednesday, we have more errors than normal. Right. So when, when we draw the chart, that's what we see. Then as a manager, right, we ask ourselves, why, why is that Wednesday? Definitely this process is out of control because here we see a pattern. But then the, question, the next question is, why do we see this special variation? Right. What is the cause or what are the causes of these? Um, then if we think hard, maybe here's a possible reason. Uh, every Wednesday we receive the truck, meaning that we uh, receive the replenishment of our stock every Wednesday. Uh, on that day, we uh, divert some of our manpower to do the receiving and uh, sorting and, and loading the, the things, right? Uh, so maybe because of that, everybody else are busy and then uh, they are prone to more mistakes, right? So that's why every Wednesday we see more errors than normal. So if, if, we, uh, if we think that is a cause, and maybe on that day we hire some time worker uh, where they will do the, the handling of the new shipment, right? And then everybody else, they should focus on their uh, current, their, their regular jobs and do it right, right? Then we will not have the errors as many as every Wednesday that we see here in the picture, right? So we always can trace back to some special cause and then we, we can think about what to do with it to avoid it in the future altogether, right? Or this picture can be the following. We have a new chef or a new server and that that time worker only works on, on Wednesday. So, because they are not properly trained yet. They make more mistakes than other SHAP or other servers, right? So in that case, we need to retrain them so that they will not make these many mistakes and the process will go back to the natural variation, right? So that's the point of using the control charts. I hope now you see that. I do not, I do not have the chance to show you how to draw the chart yet, but by now I hope that you'll be kind of learn the concept of the chart, right? And later on, when you watch the YouTube videos, you uh, see all the step through, then uh, everything should make sense for you. Uh, and you're gonna see this in question 22 and question 23 of homework three.
control chart is one of the most important tools in quality control, right? So uh, it can be applied to manufacturing and, and services. So it is used everywhere. All right. I would like to give you another example here. Um, this time around is about the trend. So we draw the timeline by the following. By the way, sometimes the patterns are very hard to find, to, to identify. So that's why nowadays we have to somehow use machine learning or uh, artificial intelligence so that they can recognize the pattern that humans I do not recognize, right? Because sometimes it's tricky and difficult to realize that it is a pattern. Okay, so, uh, but what I'm showing you is easy to find, to identify that as a pattern. So we have the band, we have the center line, and then if you draw the points, they are connected in this fashion. It is a trend, trend right here. It might go down, but then it's still, it's still sticky, right? Meaning that it is going down, it continues to go down like that. So even though all the, it looks like half of the points above, half of the points below, but here we see a trend, it is a pattern. So the process is out of control. Right, because here we see the trend. And you know what, as a manager, right, we have the, the thing hard about this. Why do we have these kind of sticky points? We have to do something about it. We need to find the, the reason behind this, right? And uh, we try to fix it. And sometimes you have to make a very drastic measure. So that's the example number six. For example, we are looking at the oil well operation. Uh, you are the manager of a oil well rig or oil rig somewhere in the middle of the ocean. I, uh, far away from the shore um, and you, you are the manager of that oil rig. So one of the variables that you have to monitor constantly is our oil well pressure. The oil well pressure is necessary so that we can pump up the, the oil and the gas. But then if the pressure is too much, right, think about it. If the pressure is too much, we might have a blowout in the middle of the ocean, in the depth of the ocean, things like that. Uh, it's very hard to fix right away, right? It takes a lot of more time to fix, not to mention sometimes it's a uh, fire or, or explosion. And then uh, we cause a lot of damages to the environment, right? It's not good at all. So that's why we have to monitor the oil while well pressure right, very closely. And it might show up as a following in our monitor. So this is a timeline, that's the uh, measurement of the oil well pressure. Uh, we also have the regular band right here. All right, so at first, everything looks normal like this. But today, something looks like this. Right? Now, if we don't do anything, the oil, the oil well pressure might go all the way up beyond the, the upper limit. And upper limit means that we go out of the regular band, the regular region. So in this particular case, it's essential because it means that the pressure might be too much and we might have a blowout, right? Uh, so as a good manager, we will not let the blowout to happen. If we see a trend like this, we're gonna stop it right before, no, right be, not right before, but before, while well before or before enough, uh, before that uh, blowout, right? So we stop it here rather than let it go out and, and stop it.
right? This is very critical. Uh, but of, co of course, stopping it here is, is difficult. It means that we have to uh, stop the operation. We have to stop the shipment of our goods. We have to uh, sacrifice our part of our revenues. But sometimes it is necessary. Otherwise, they will, uh, will it will cost like millions of dollars or even more to to fix the problem. Right. So uh, in this case, we have a out of control situation because we see that train and because it is a critical process, sometimes we have to stop the line. This is in manufacturing. How about in service? Um, four years ago, I think at um, Starbucks, there's a racial bias incident, right? They, the 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 new is everywhere about that racial bias. So the leadership at, at the Starbucks they think that if we don't do anything, something like that will happen again and again, right? So in one afternoon, uh, they stop. They they close down all the Starbucks store, and they retrain all the workers about racial biases, right? And and. We have not seen anything bad about Starbucks again regarding to the racial biases, right? Because they already tried to stop the line right there and, and then they remedy the situation. They return the workers so that we, in, in the future, we don't have to talk about it, right? So I hope that through this example, uh, the concepts are clearer uh, for you. And, uh, and now uh, when you draw the charts, it's gonna be easier for you. Does anybody have a question for me? Are you good so far? Okay, good. Thank you, uh, Colin, for your feedback. So now let's. Uh, so we're done with this conformance analysis. So now we need to move on to the next topic, right? Let me show you the big picture, and then we will uh, talk about that. Um, so let me go back to the the main four activities, the four main activities of SBC. Right here. So we already talk about capability analysis. We talk about conformance analysis, and after we uh, after we monitor our process and if we see the special variation. Then the next step is we need to find the cause or the causes of the special variation, right? So that's the next step right here. And then uh, after we find the cause of the causes, we're gonna find a better way to avoid them, right? So um, in the next thing, we talk about these, and at the end of this module five, we talk about that, right? So uh, so finally, we we will after we talk about this, we're gonna close off this module five. So let me show you the slides of this. Assignable cause analysis uh, section. It should be somewhere here. So first of all, we're going to talk about the cause and effect diagrams. Right, the cause and effect diagram looks like this. After that, we talk about the five Y techniques. That's an example right here. Uh, and uh, after that, we talk about the Pareto diagram. Okay, is another technique that uh, they they uh, they use a lot to, to investigate for the causes. Right. Okay. So we're going to learn about three three uh, main three popular techniques to uh, to investigate for the assignable causes. Uh, and after that, in the step number four or the fourth main activity, we will learn how to make a process more robust, right? So there'll be three groups of, of measures or methods to make the process more robust. Okay, so let me go back to the cause and effect diagram and, and talk about that. One. All right, so we're still in module four. We talk about the next topic of uh, assignable cause analysis.
Oh, I'm sorry. The big topic, not not this. Oh, not uh, my mind is sleep. All right, so uh, sustainable cause analysis, sustainable cause analysis. So here we talk about different techniques. To investigate or, or to find the causes, right? Causes of special variation. What causes what attributed to the problem, right? Uh, so uh, the first technique that we learn here is called the cause and effect diagram. Cause effect or cause and effect, right? Diagram. I would like to say right away uh, that you would have a chance to use this diagram in the project part five. Okay, so um, in the textbook, in the slide, I, I have the example for you, but I would like to take another example for you. So we have a, another perspective to look at the cause and diagram, effect diagram. Okay, so um, cause and effect diagram means that we draw a map that try to explain some effect, right? So we draw that line and say that that's the effect of the situation. Um, and in this particular case, as an example, I would like to talk about the Boeing uh 737 max incidences it also happens about two years before the pandemic okay so there were two fatal accidents the company of course it's been loss of life is very bad but for the company they lose also money too they have to compensate for the uh, victims Right, and then uh, they also have to pay for the damages to to all of the airlines because they have to ground the seven three seven for a long long time, right? They lose a lot of, of, of revenues because they have to ground their seven three seven fleet. So in total, it can be the all of the money that that Boeing pays out possibly more than one hundred billion dollars. Think about it, okay? But of course, they are a big company. But anyhow, one hundred billion dollars is not small, right? It's, it's a huge for any company. All right, so the Boeing team they had to sit down. What went wrong? What what might be the culprit behind uh, those incidences? So uh, the team sit down and discuss, and to do that, they will draw a very big map in front of their eyes like this, right? Either, either on the paper or, or nowadays we do that you know, on our tablet, right? There's many apps out there, uh, like the sticky notes app so that we can draw a map and then everybody can chip in a, a note on the map, right? So they might agree that, okay, let's start with some big group of causes. These are the big groups of causes. We don't have any specific specificity in here yet, but let's let's think about these first group as the technology group. Technology might be the main problem here, but sometimes the human factor might be part of the problem too. And government regulation, right? Because, because of the critical and the risk of flying. That's why all of the, the aviation operations have to be supervised by government agency or by the FAA, right? They closely monitor the operations, uh, the main operations of, of the airlines. And then uh, we talk about the fourth uh, group of factors here as the environment. 
but the weather, things like that, impact a lot on how the airplane would operate. So, for example, now we come up with four major groups of possible errors or causes, right? Then in each group, now we can do more detail. For example, you might think about these as a hardware. That might be the software too, right? And then in the human factor, we might have, for example, uh, pilot training or minutes. I mean, training of the minutes worker. That's crucial. Um, and then uh, regulation, for example, it is the approval process. Right? We don't know which one is the main factor or anything. We just make a list out here of all possible causes, right? Or, or one of the factors that might lead to the incidences. All right, so the approval process by the FAA, things like that. Um, and in, in the Boeing case, that was a big fail because the government let the company to measure things by themselves and report to the government. The government sh should supposedly measure things independently, right? But then because they trust Boeing too much, they let them uh, record the data by themselves. Then it's not an independent process anymore. And then in terms of the environment, right? They uh, uh, we, we have to worry about the weather, like the temperature, the uh, humidity, the wind speed, things like that, the direction of the, the wind, things like that. Oh, um, and one more thing. So now we already go from the gen, the, the, big, the biggest level to the sub group level, right? But inside the subgroup, we can either even have further details. For example, in the hardware, we can make it down to different things, including the sensor. Sensors are, are crucial. The normal flyers will never know that the sensors are there, uh, even right? But they are very crucial for the operations of an airplane. Um, so all of these, my contribute to the to the effect or the, the incidences in some way. Right? So at the end of the day, they have a, an extensive tree like this, where we have the big picture of my, my contribute to the incidents. And then uh, at, the, at the end, they might break down into different parts, different uh, departments will take care of different parts, in, investigate that further, things like that, right? But at least now we have a, a kind of very extensive map of uh, the contributing factors, possible contributing factors to the effects. Okay, so this is ca called the cause and effect diagram, right? We have the effect and we try to explain why we have that effect. So that's the first uh, technique that we learned here. The second technique that I would like to mention here is called the five Y technique. We call it as a five Y technique because we ask the question why five times. But this five Ys are not random uh, Ys, okay? Let me uh, give you uh, the diagram for that and then hopefully you see the meaning behind this. Uh, you, you will see that right away. So we have an effect, for example, a machine breaks down or something like that, right? That's a, a, a bad effect. And now we try to explain it. Uh, by the way, I forgot to mention that earlier. This diagram right here looks like a fishbone. So a lot of the time people will call that as a fishbone diagram. Okay, sorry, I have to digress a little bit. All right, let's go back to the five wire techniques. So we have a, a, an effect like a machine failure. The question is, why does that fail, Why? Right? And then you might have a quick answer. So we, let's call that as um, explanation number one.
But then based on that explanation, explanation number one, we, we go one step further. We ask why, why, why that, right? So we ask the second why based on the first answer. So this is why number two, based on the first answer, not the first why. So uh, when we ask that question, now we find another explanation. Explanation number two, right? And then uh, with that, we are not content with that explanation yet. As a five wire techniques, we're gonna ask five times. So that's not enough yet. Because if we stop it at the shallow level, we have shallow understanding of the problem. And if we only have a quick fix, then in the future, the problem will happen again and again, right? So we think that Y2 is, or explanation number two is still at the shallow level. We, we are not content with that. Uh, and that's why we go one more step and ask the third Y. And we get another layer of explanation here. And um, as a rule of thumb is, maybe that's not enough. In this five wire techniques, we have to do it five times. So why four? And then we, uh, we have explanation number four. But maybe that's not enough. And that's why we need to ask another one. Y5, okay? And then we have these uh, explanation number five. And possibly this time we find the, uh, possibly we find the root cause of the, the, of the effect that we have at the beginning. beginning. All right. So the goal here is we dig deep so far, the root cause, rather than uh, be content with the easy or the quick answer. Right? So we need to dig deep to find the root causes. Uh, by the way, uh, there's a famous example about Toyota. I encourage you to uh, read about that. Let me uh, give you the reference, okay? So the five wire techniques is on the slide 63. So the example here is a machine failure, a Toyota um, Okay, and uh, this is a uh, module five and slide 63. So basically there's a machine failure and they ask why the machine fails. The uh, first answer is the fuse blows. And they ask why the fuse blow. And they go deeper and deeper the, into the situation. And then uh, eventually they find the root cause of the problem. And then if we fix the root cause or the root causes, and then in the future, we don't have to deal with the effect again or the, the incidents or the problems again. Right. So I would like to, uh, I, I encourage you to read more about this example in on slide 63. And I would like to end our class here. And uh, I'd uh, like to see you back on uh, on Wednesday. So uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Hey, Professor, I got a question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. Um, before I go, so um, <clears throat> the test to redo, that's due in about two weeks, right? If I believe, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. No. Um, do I have to redo the whole test or the parts I got wrong? Um, the bottom line is you need to redo from question one to question 12. Mm -hmm. uh, the question one to 10 of the multiple choice, right? Yeah, I missed like two of those. Do I have to? Yeah, during the exam, you only do A, B, C, D. Yeah. But after a while, you need to write A, B, C, D, and then you have a brief explanation of why you, you think it is correct. Only the ones that got wrong, though, right? No, I don't no, have to no. Do the whole test. 
one to 10. And then question 11 and 12, you also need to redo them because during the exam, you only give me the, uh, gave me the, the numerical answers, right? Yeah. But this time around, I would like to see your steps of calculation. So please do also 11 and 12, uh, okay. no matter what you got in the exam. And okay. then uh, for question 13 and 14, if you make more than 16 points, 16 or above, then you only need to redo the missing parts. The wrong or the missing parts, okay? Okay. For 13, 14. But if you make less than sixteen, then you uh, please do the redo the whole questions. Okay. Yeah. And then what? What's the grading criteria once once it's uh, complete? What do you? How does that work? It's just... the, the learning opportunity for everybody. So I only count that you already did it. And of course, I will look inside to see if you show me the details. Uh, okay, I, I, I see. I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, so if you will do it correct. I mean, if you show me the work, I'll give you 10 points. Okay. Okay. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you for asking. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Okay. Welcome. All right. See you next. See you Wednesday. Okay. See you. Okay. So uh, I hope everybody else is doing good. Do you have any uh, quick questions for me? Okay, so uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, and uh, we'll need to close the meeting.